Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today, we're covering one of the most powerful late game characters in the entire game, using a very unusual combination of classes. In fact, I think this character might be the single strongest character in the end game of Baldur's Gate, in the sense that once this character comes online, it's almost impossible to lose the game even if you're trying to. In most fights in Act 3, you'll be able to solo the fight entirely uh, by just hitting end turn and taking no other their actions and be completely invincible, uh, almost immune to damage and unable to die. This build grew out of my recently completed multi-class tier list where I went over every combination in the game for multi-classing, so definitely check that out if you haven't seen it because it's really good, um, and was a very unusual combination that I rated interesting and wanted to come back to. So the combination of classes that we're talking about here is Barbarian and Wizard. At first glance, these characters don't seem, these classes don't seem like they're going to go well together, but this build makes use of the powerful abilities of both classes to make an in extremely powerful late game character, capable of soloing pretty much the entirety of Act 3 without ever lifting a finger. I think this uh, this build does come online a little later, so you trade some of the late game power level in exchange for a slightly rockier early early game, and so for best results I'd recommend respecking into this build sometime around level 7, but I don't think it's unplayable for the first 6 levels or anything. It will definitely be uh, a totally viable and powerful build throughout those levels, just because you're a pretty much full class wizard, but um, for the really broken combos to come online you're looking at sort of the later levels of the build. Alright, let's get into it and start building this character. Before I begin, I do want to say thank you so much to Spencer Rex for the $5 donation, Dolores Abernathy for becoming a channel member, Dante977 for the £20, JAH5391 for the $15, and Crater for the $5 twice, so $10. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. It really does mean a lot. If you've donated recently and didn't hear your name there, um, I will be... I'm playing catch up a little bit, so I'll get you in a future video, but thank you so much to everyone, and I really do appreciate the support. All right, let's jump in and start building the character. So I'm using Gale as the example character for this build because he's obviously the wizard of the party, and this is primarily a wizard build, um, but, and of course the idea of Gale as an unstoppable raging bodybuilder is really funny to me, so I just really like that image. But if you're building this for a main character, then some good options for race. Uh, obviously all the normally high quality ones apply. Wood Elf for bonus movement speed, Githyanki for misty step, Halfling to reroll ones, Dwargar for invisibility. All of those are still just good for this build. But a couple interesting options that don't work as well with most builds work really well with this character. Half Orcs really Relentless Endurance, keeping you alive at one hit point, plays very well into this character's uh, defensive themes and can get you out of some sticky situations where you've absorbed maybe one too many hits before you become invincible in the late game. And uh, Asmodeus Tiefling gets access to Hellish Rebuke. Since this will be this build will be primarily doing its damage by being attacked, Hellish Rebuke can add a little bit of extra damage to your character a couple times, and so that can be pretty useful as well. So just a couple uh, non-traditional options to go with this somewhat non-traditional build, which is something that I really like about it. For our initial level, we're actually going to start with Barbarian for a couple of reasons. One is that Barbarian, as you can see here, gets Constitution Save Proficiency, and this build will benefit, just like every caster build, from having Con Save Proficiency to allow you to maintain concentration on spells more easily. Now, losing concentration on spells won't really be a problem in the late game because you just won't be taking any damage, but Con Save Proficiency is still just very good for, for casters in general. And the Medium Armor and Shield Proficiency that you get from being a Barbarian at level 1 helps out a lot as well. You also, because you're a Barbarian, get 12 hit points at first level. And this build has so many multipliers to its hit points that every single point of HP you have is worth something like 10 or 15 HP for another build, and in the very late game is worth like 50 HP for any other character. So even those bonus six or so hit points compared to taking other class levels at first level end up being a tremendous amount of effective hit points and a tremendous amount of survivability. So taking level one barbarian helps a lot. If you want to build this character as a main character and thus want more dialogue skills, we will be taking a level of sorcerer. So you can take sorcerer as your first level. You still get con save proficiency. You get the dialogue skills, um, but you lose out on the hit points. So for pure power in combat, the barbarian 
initial level is the strongest. For our ability scores, we're going to be taking some ability scores that look quite unusual for a barbarian, so let's just reset everything to zero here, and we will be taking 14 dexterity, 16 constitution, uh, pretty normal for a barbarian so far, but also 16 intelligence, and 12 wisdom. This is a normal wizard stat split, so you, you will recognize it from other wizard builds, but this character will be doing damage primarily with its intelligence. That being said, if you don't intend to be using spells that have hit rolls or save DCs, and this character will mostly be doing damage with spells that don't, um, then you can put those points from intelligence elsewhere and potentially take some feats. So you have some flexibility there, but having high intelligence not only lets you use your actual spell casting for more than just armor of Agathis, it also lets you use scrolls very effectively. And this character, because it's almost invincible, will be one of the best uh, scroll users in the game as well. So it's nice to have that and you can get elithid powers and so on that scale off your intelligence as well. So all of those are pretty useful. For our skill selection, just make sure you have Perception. It's the only really important skill on the Barbarian skill list if you're not an athletics-based build. Um, Gale, by default, has Arcana, History, and Persuasion as well. Um, it's different in this save because I moved it to sleight of hand before they patched it, so you couldn't move his human skill point anymore. Um, but he by default, normally we'll have Arcana, History, and Persuasion, and so he can still be a reasonable party face even if you don't take uh, Sorcerer as your first level or put any points in Charisma, because those are useful in those... Uh, those skills are useful in conversations, but Perception is the most important one. Other than that, no decisions that we need to make at level 1, though it's notable that we do get access to unarmored defense, which is moderately useful for casters in robes, and also get access to rage, which gives you resistance to physical damage, which will help uh, in the early game once we get access to armor of Agathis. So, let's go ahead and level up, and we will be taking our second level in Sorcerer. The reason for this is that we want access to Armor of Agathis, because that's how we'll be doing most of our damage, by having enemies hit us, and the retaliation damage from Armor of Agathis will slowly kill them, or in the late game, quite rapidly kill them. We get that by taking Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer, which gives us an additional hit point, and also with the White Dragon Ancestry, gets Armor of Agathis as a spell known. It's better to do it this way than by taking a Warlock, level because you don't lose a caster level this way, so our wizard is still going to be gaining spell progression, um, but we also get Armor of Agathis, and we get a bunch of other cool stuff from Sorcerer in, in terms of cantrips and spell selection. For our cantrip selection, you want to make sure that you're taking cantrips on Sorcerer, because we only have eight charisma, that don't have saving throws, and that don't have... Um, attack rolls, so we're not taking any combat cantrips, but that lets us take all of our utility cantrips on this character. So we can grab Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, and Blade Ward, all three, uh, very easily. And then we can take Friends if we want to be talking to people, Light if we think that we'll need light, which is all, always very useful. So since we're not building this for a party face, I'm just going to take light here, but Friends, if you are a party face, can also be very useful as well. For our spell selection, again, we just want to avoid spells on our sorcerer level that have save DCs or attack rolls because our charisma is so bad, but we will always want to have shield prepared. It's just an incredible defensive action, so I suggest grabbing that from your sorcerer levels. Um, and then in addition to that, any other utility spell that you want uh, or something like magic missile can be pretty useful as well. Um, I'm just going to grab Magic Missile here, because you'll always want to have that prepared, and so it's very useful to just have it, and it doesn't use your intelligence or anything along those lines. It doesn't use a stat at all, so even though it's a combat spell, you can still use it at these early levels. At this level, you will start playing mostly as a just a tanky sorcerer, just magic missling things, um, and probably still just be doing most of your attacks with your 14 dexterity and a light crossbow or something like that, if you wanted to play this character from level 1, but... Um, that is at least a contribution, but you'll need party members to carry you through the early levels if this, if this is a build that you really want to play from level 1. Like I mentioned, this is more of a late game focused build. Other than that, no decisions to make from Sorcerer, so we are good there, and we are going to level up again. At level 3, we get to take our Wizard level. And one reason we do it in this order is that this way Wizard will be our last new level, so the last level, last class we selected a level 1 in. Um, 
And the game uses that to determine what the save DC of your spells cast from scrolls and items is. So it's very useful to make sure that we have that set to intelligence so that if we use illicit powers, if we use um, items to create uh, effects that rely on save DC or cast spells from items or use a scroll to actually cast rather than learn it for a wizard, it still uses our intelligence. So you definitely want to take these two levels first and then your level of wizard in order to optimize the order of this character. For our cantrip selection here, we can now take a combat cantrip, and the combat cantrip we're going to take is Ray of Frost. This build will be making extensive use of wet or cold vulnerability in general, and so Ray of Frost is excellent. And we're going to... Uh, this will, this will please all of the Shocking Grasp fans in the audience, of which I know I have many. We're actually going to grab Shocking Grasp here, again, because this is a, a build that is a melee-focused wizard build. Enemies will often be wet, and so Shocking Grasp can come up occasionally um, in, that, in those circumstances. Uh, that being said, sometimes you actually want to provoke attacks of opportunity with this character, so you don't want to Shocking Grasp in if you want to do that, because then you will remove the enemy reaction. A very common strategy for this character, because we will be invincible, we'll be doing a lot of retaliation damage with Armor of Agathis, is to move up next to an enemy and then move away to deliberately provoke an opportunity attack to get some extra damage and end fights faster. Finally, we're going to take True Strike just to annoy people in the comments. Then in the spell selection, uh, for our level 1 spells, we are going to just grab other spells that we want from level 1 wizard. So again, spells with save DCs are important. <laughs> the great thing about the True Strike joke, by the way, is that um, because I have made this joke like 20 times or something over the last 5 months, the people who were initially annoyed by me suggesting True Strike on characters that didn't have any other useful cantrips to take are even angrier now because they've heard this joke 20 times. So it just gets funnier and funnier every single time. Um, anyways, let's get back to spell selection. We are going to take the Chromatic Orb, and, uh, because this is just an extremely versatile spell, you can create ice surfaces with it, and it will be very powerful. Grease is a great control spell at this level. We already have shield. I don't know why it's uh, still showing up in our level up options, but we have shield from our sorcerer levels. You can then grab some more utility spells, although you probably want like Thunder Wave, Fog Cloud, Find Familiar is very good, Enhanced Leap and Long Strider. Also, of course, this will depend on what scrolls you have found because you'll uh, want to be learning many of these spells from scrolls. So your spell selection is going to depend somewhat on what spells you have not yet uh, learned from scrolls. For prepared spells here, ignore the higher level spells, that's just because Gale in this save has learned some spells from scrolls. For prepared spells, you just want to make sure that you have the combat spells that we just selected. You probably want long striders to grade on every party, so you're going to end up looking something like this with Chromatic Orb, Long Strider, Grease, and Fog Cloud, as well as Magic Missile and Shield from your Sorcerer levels. level 4, or wizard level 2, we get to take the subclass that makes this combination work, and that is Abjuration Wizard. Abjuration Wizard has Arcane Ward, one of the single most powerful features in the entire game, and one of the most incredibly broken features in the game that will make this build completely invincible in the late game. Arcane Ward uh, has a terrible tooltip, but how it works is that you gain, every time you cast an Abjuration spell, you gain stacks of ward equal to the level of that spell, up to a maximum of double your wizard levels. So at this level, we can have up to four stacks of arcane ward. When you take damage, it's reduced by that number, and then you lose one stack of arcane ward. So if you take 10 damage with four stacks of ward, you would only take six, and then you'd have three stacks of ward. This becomes very powerful the more of this you can stack on, and Barbarian gives us rage. Rage while it prevents you from casting spells, doesn't prevent you from having Armor of Agathis active, and halves incoming damage, incoming physical damage. Um, that means that we are getting double value, both out of the Arcane Ward damage block, and out of the... Actually, we're getting significantly more than double value out of the Arcane Ward damage block. I'll... I'll do some math for you in a moment. Um, and we're getting double value out of the armor of Agathis temporary hit points. So we're getting an extreme amount of value uh, from these two defensive features and can take staggering amounts of damage before we lose armor of Agathis or die. 
For our spell selection at this level, we're just going to grab whatever we haven't found from scrolls, just anything that seems uh, particularly valuable. Obviously, it's nice to have Find Familiar. We can take Disguise Self. Kind of running out of good level 1 spells here. You could take Ice Knife if you want an alternative to Chromatic Orb. Um, but mostly just whatever you haven't found from scrolls at this point. At character level 3, we continue to level up Wizard, and every point we put into Wizard now, every level we put into Wizard, um, or excuse me, at character level 5, every level we put into Wizard gives us more maximum Arcane Ward, and it multiplies extremely well together uh, alongside the multipliers that we're already applying, meaning that we are getting tankier and tankier every level of Wizard we put in. At this point, it's still possible that we can die, because we only have 6 damage block, and so enemies will be able to break through that, but pretty quickly, our damage block combined with half damage from Blade Ward or Rage will outpace enemy incoming damage, which is why I say this build comes really online around level 7 or so. Um, at level 2 spell selection, we get to take some higher level spells. Make sure you have Misty Step. I think Gale has learned it from a scroll here, so it's not showing as available. But also very useful to have is Cloud of Daggers, just an incredibly powerful spell. Um, and then you also need to have Arcane Lock, because it's an abjuration spell that you can spam outside of combat to stack up your Arcane Ward. You can just repeatedly cast this to max out your ward before you go into combat. For our prepared spells, we definitely need to make sure we have Arcane Lock prepared, and probably Misty Step as well, alongside our combat spells, and then we can go to our next level. At Wizard level 4, we get access to a feat, and we're just going to take an ability improvement to continue to increase our intelligence, because we're just a fully functional wizard, basically, at this point. We have 5th level casting, so we've basically only spent, well, we're only behind in terms of casting by one level, and we'll now have access to third level spells from scrolls, thanks to our sorcerer level and our four wizard levels, making us extremely powerful, and we're not actually behind where other characters are. We also have eight ma maximum arcane ward, making us extremely difficult to kill. Um, we also, of course, get an additional cantrip. At this point, it really doesn't matter what you take. You can grab Dancing Lights or whatever. And for our spell selection, you are going to take basically whatever you haven't found from scrolls yet. Uh, the important ones at this level are going to be actually level 3 spells that you'll have learned from scrolls. So I'll show you in the prepared section, but you're going to want to grab stuff like Flaming Sphere, which can be nice to concentrate on. Now remember, you can't concentrate on spells while raging, so if you want to concentrate on a spell, use Blade Ward and instead of Rage at this level, um, but you can definitely do that. For our prepared spells here, we will now know level 3 spells, because we have them from uh, scrolls, so we can now prepare third level spells. I recommend preparing stuff like Fear and Hypnotic Pattern, which are extremely powerful. Haste, if you can grab that as well, is very good. Uh, just anything that you want to be maintaining concentration on. This character at this level is excellent at maintaining concentration. Um, and we'll start soloing the enemies probably around next level. Uh, which let's see what we're going to level up now. So wizard level 5 I think is a great break point for this character. We're going to want to take some more levels in not wizard for reasons you'll see shortly. But wizard level 5 gets us 10 arcane ward. Which means that most enemies at this level are dealing somewhere between like 15 and 25 damage per attack. If you're having that damage with blade ward and then taking only... Um, let's say 12 damage, 10 damage is blocking almost all the incoming damage, and enemies are then taking 15 damage return from a level 3 armor of Agathis, which is going to kill them very quickly, certainly before they can get through your arcane ward. At this level, we get to take Counterspell. There is no scroll of Counterspell, so that's another reason to hit wizard level, actual wizard level 5, so you get Counterspell and can uh, do a reaction. Interestingly enough, Counterspell, because it's a reaction, um, can actually be cast while raging. Ca both Counterspell and Shield can be cast while raging, which is a bug, um, and they don't give you Arcane Ward charges, <laughs> despite being Abjuration spells. Um, but... Uh, Though that's a bug, it is a, a powerful effect that you have access to while raging on this character. And then we're going to grab Glyph of Warding. When not raging, this is going to be your main source of in-combat um, 
power. You can use this as an abjuration spell that stacks Arcane Ward. It's of course an incredibly powerful spell in and of itself, doing tons of damage, but also you can rage for the first parts of combat, then cancel out of rage if you want to refresh your Arcane Ward and just start casting Glyphs of Warding to stack the ward back up once you've taken a couple hits. That means that the play pattern for this character is incredibly smooth because you can enter combat, go into a rage, um, take a couple hits, dealing a bunch of return damage, and then if the fight's going long and you're starting to run out of Arcane Ward, you just cancel out of Rage and start spamming out Glyphs of Warding to stack it back up. At that point, you're not at any risk once we've hit, like, Wizard level 7 or so, because the amount of damage block and damage resistance you have is going to stop enemy damage extremely reliably. That being said, I think we can still do better, so let's level up, and we are going to now jump back into Levels of Barbarian. Barbarian level um, 2 actually gives us some really cool things. One, it's just a lot more hit points, and we talked already about how good hit points are. But we also get Reckless Attack. On turns where we're not, um, where we're in rage and not casting spells, Reckless Attack is really good for this character because you want to be attacked. Attacking recklessly and having low AC will make enemies much more likely to hit you because the enemy targeting in this game is based on how easy it is for them to land their attacks. They're much more likely to attack characters that they think they're easy, that they are very likely to hit. Um, and so giving them advantage is really good for you. You can also, again, as I mentioned, deliberately provoke attacks of opportunity to stack even more armor of Agathis damage on your opponents, and that is a very powerful strategy as well. Reckless Attack, therefore, has a lot of synergy with this build and is something that you're going to want to be using aggressively, uh, even, just, even though your attacks themselves won't do that much damage. Although with 18 Intelligence, you can use the Sylvan Scimitar or the... Um, Infernal Rapier and end up with uh, attacks based on your intelligence, which will do moderately reasonable damage as well. So there are some uh, and hit very reliably thanks to Reckless Attack. So there's some options for actually doing attack damage as well. Mostly you're using this to provoke enemy attacks as a sort of pseudo taunt. And then finally, at Barbarian level 3, we get to take Wild Heart Barbarian. Um, and that gets us access to Bear Heart Barbarian. This means that while raging, all incoming damage is halved. We get resistance to all damage except for psychic damage, making us almost unkillable under basically all normal circumstances. As we continue to stack up our Arcane Ward, this halving of incoming damage, which applies before the Arcane Ward damage reduction, I should make that clear, is incredibly valuable. It's also uh, this... Bearheart Rage stacks with Warding Bond as well as a way to have damage, so that will quarter incoming damage if you get an ally or camp follower to cast uh, Warding Bond on you. Although the, the Warding Bond applies after the damage reduction, so it won't actually quarter incoming damage, but it'll prevent damage from spilling over to your actual hit points. Um, but Bearheart Rage is so good for this character because you get to have all incoming damage, doesn't matter if it's magical, doesn't matter what type it is, any non-psychic damage you are taking half damage from and are therefore going to uh, take no damage from because any damage instance of 20 or less we just get to completely ignore, more if we have gear that reduces our damage, and I'll talk about that when we get to gear. Uh, and then of course as we level up we get to ignore even more incoming damage, and every time we get hit the enemies take a bunch of return damage. This synergy is very powerful and means that our arcane ward will keep us alive under uh, astonishing amounts of incoming damage. At this next level, we go back to Wizard, because we just want to keep leveling up our Arcane Ward. We also get access to 4th level spells, which will include Fire Shield, which I'll talk about in, in a second. We get Projected Ward here, which you can use to protect allies. Now, you'd rather just tank the attacks yourself than use Projected Ward on allies, but this is good in an emergency. Um, but since we're taking half damage from all incoming sources, the, the ward is usually better spent on us rather than on projecting onto an ally, but still good if an ally is tanking an attack that you want to prevent them from dying to. And then we can grab stuff like Haste, stuff like Sleet Storm. These are all just good spells that we can have for combats where you don't want to use a Rage. You can 
just be a normal wizard and still just have a ton of arcane ward, just like a normal abjuration wizard, you'll be one spell level behind where you would be on most characters. But a wizard who's one spell level behind is still a totally viable honor mode character. So you will be able to play um, fights where you don't want to spend a rage charge just as a normal wizard. And that means that this character has plenty of longevity, even though it only gets... Uh, a couple rage charges per day, only gets three rage charges per day, because you can just play non-rage fights just with normal wizard spells. Then at wizard level seven, let's make sure that we have fire shield. If we haven't found a scroll of that, we definitely want to pick that up uh, here, because Fire Shield adds to our Retaliation damage. Now, the tooltip on Fire Shield is somewhat misleading here. It says 4 to 32 damage, but it's counting both kinds of damage types uh, in that calculation, so it actually only does one or the other of these two. But a Fire Shield set to Cold adds 2d8 cold damage, which averages 9 cold damage. And then since enemies will often be wet or vulnerable to cold from items, since you'll be um, throwing water bottles or having a uh, cleric cast create water on them, um, you'll double that. So it's 18 damage every time they hit you, which adds up pretty fast. You also then get resistance to fire damage, but you already had resistance to fire damage from bear rage, so that part isn't that important. But combined with the 25 damage from armor of Agathis, the, uh, which doubles to 50, the additional 18 damage gets you to 68 damage. So you only need one additional point of damage to be doing the perfect amount of return damage. Um, with Fire Shield will get you there pretty quickly. Other than that, you're just going to want utility spells. Things like Conjure Minor Elemental are actually really good on this character because you can cast it at the beginning of the day and benefit throughout the whole day. You And since you won't usually be casting spells in most combats because you'll be raging and therefore unable to cast, Conjure Minor Elementals is a way to gain value from your spell slots over the course of the day. Out of combat, you're just going to be using Arcane Lock or um, Glyph of Warding to stack your ward, so we don't need to, to grab Abjuration spells of any kind, um, even if there were good ones at level 4 to grab, uh, but we have better ways to just stack our Arcane Ward anyways. At wizard level 8, we get to max out our intelligence, making us just as intelligent as any other wizard. And we now hit 5th level spell slots, so we can have Conjure Elementals, or though generally speaking you're going to use your 5th level spell to cast Armor of Agathis at max level. A max level Armor of Agathis is 25 temporary hit points and 25 return damage on every attack. And because we now have 16 points of Arcane Ward and are halving incoming damage, enemies need to do 32 damage with an attack to even scratch us at all. Consider, for example, an enemy that does 30 damage per attack um, and attacks four times in a round. This would be a pretty powerful late game enemy and uh, would be relatively dangerous. That's enough damage that it would kill in a single round of attacks most characters in the game. Against this character, those four attacks for 30 damage, the first one would be halved, do 15 damage, and so you would take zero. The second one would be halved, do 15 damage, so you'd take zero. The third one would be halved, do 15 damage, so you'd take one, because we now have 14 points of Arcane Ward, and the fourth one would do two. So instead of 120 damage from that enemy, we'd have taken three damage. If we had additional sources of damage reduction, it would get even better, and there's ways to add those from gear. So you can see how much incoming damage this character needs to be uh, suffering from before it's even in any danger at all. At this point, you can basically um, cast Armor of Agathis, go into combat, enter Rage, and then just hit End Turn five times, and you'll win every combat in the game, because the retaliation damage will just kill enemies. Of course, there are ways to make that even faster by like provoking opportunity attacks, recklessly attacking to force enemies to attack you, uh, as well as add a little bit of extra damage, and so on. Um, together, between Bearheart Rage and Abjuration Wizard stacking, you are invincible to most attacks from most enemies in the game. Now, single huge damage instances can still hit you. If you get hit by Disintegrate, can still hurt you. If you get hit by Disintegrate, you'll still take a lot of damage. If you get hit by... Um, some of the really powerful six level spells, you'll still take a lot of damage. Finger of Death will still kill you through your damage reduction. So there are effects that can get through it, but any enemy that relies on doing damage to you, you will be able to basically completely ignore. 
At this point, also, we just get to take some additional spells. It doesn't really matter what we take. Um, having Ice Storm is pretty nice for combats where we aren't raging. And our uh, prepared spell selection will look something along the lines of Fire Shield, Conjure Elementals. We need to have our uh, Glyph of Warning. We need to have Counter Spell. Mostly, you're using these spells for utility. So you want, like, Enhanced Leap and Long Strider for out of combat. You need uh, Arcane Lock to be spamming outside of combat. And then in combat, you want Shield from your Sorcerer levels and counterspell because you can use those uh, while raging um, which is a bug but uh, you know it's it's possible and then any leftover spell slots that you aren't spending on arcane ward stacking you can use for summons or long-term utility like that as you can see we have one fifth level spell slot so we can use that to cast armor of agathis at fifth level which will stack up our arcane ward and then we just need to spam a couple more spell slots in order to get to 16 at the beginning of the day. You also have your Arcane Recovery Charge that you can use to gain more spell slots and any additional spells that you get. Also worth noting is that spells cast from scrolls do stack Arcane Ward if they're Abjuration spells. There aren't that many that you can cast from scrolls, but it is a way to grab some, some charge if you... Uh, need it in a pinch. I'd recommend spending your level 2 spell slots first, so we can spend uh, like Arcane Lock three times to get to 13, and then one level 3 spell slot, and that will get us to, um, you'll have to find other stuff to lock, but that'll get us to, uh, or rather we can dismiss it and then lock it again. That'll get us to our 16 pretty neatly if you do the level 5 um, Armor of Agathis plus Arcane Lock three times plus one cast of Glyph of Warding or a level 3 Arcane Lock, uh, will get it, get you to 16 damage block, making you very, very difficult to kill. Then in combat, you enter Bear Rage, which you can do three times per day, and so this character actually has a decent amount of longevity. That being said, I think we can do even better, so let's talk about gear, because there's some gear choices that really help this character shine even more, um, despite already being nearly invincible, we can do even better than that. Obviously, anything that works with cold damage is good, but a couple things really stand out. Morning Frost is great because it can inflict vulnerability. Uh, chilled is a way to inflict vulnerability on enemies, um, and it does uh, an additional point of cold damage whenever you deal cold damage. That point is doubled. You're dealing a lot of cold damage. When an enemy hits you and they take Armor of Agathis and Fire Shield damage, that's two instances, so the Morning Frost damage applies twice, both of those are doubled, that adds up pretty quickly. Also, Snowburst Ring, whenever you deal cold damage, you create ice around the target. This makes enemies hit you and then fall over, um, which is extremely funny. And finally, one item that is really, really good is the Bone Spike Garb, which both gives you temp hit points whenever you rage, so if you, for whatever reason, run out of Armor of Agathis but want to keep going with this character, you can gain additional temporary hit points, making you very, very hard to kill. This doesn't stack with Armor of Agathis, but is still useful. But more importantly, it just reduces all incoming damage by two, basically giving you a whole wizard level for free, um, and getting you access to extra arcane ward that doesn't decrease. So this damage block will let you take even more hits before you die uh, with the Bone Spike Garb. Those are three items that really help out a lot. Other than that, initiative items are really good for this character. Anything that increases your initiative is really good. Anything that increases your cold damage is really good. And any form of retaliation damage, note that the Bone Spike Garb also does retaliation damage, is really good as well. Um, save DC items are less important than for other casters, so this build will not actually conflict with other casters for items, which is one of the nice things about it. You can also build this... Uh, character up to be pretty tanky. Notice that we're in a robe, but because we have unarmored defense, we have 19 AC already, just from a shield and from our unarmored defense. So, And then we have the shield spell. So if you don't want to get hit, you can also avoid taking hits a lot of the time, in addition to the fact that any hits that actually do land will not, will not hurt you. If you wanted to play this build solo, which I think it would be very good at, then obviously the higher the AC you have, the better, so that's another option for stacking this character's uh, power level into the sky. All right, my friends, this has been the look at the Invincible Rage Wizard. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this one. It's, it's fun to combine classes like this in weird ways that still result in incredibly powerful characters, uh, and... 
if you have enjoyed the video, then definitely let me know in the comments below or let me know if you haven't, you know, uh, I will appreciate feedback either way. And of course, if you want to help out the channel in terms of the algorithm, leaving a comment and liking the video helps me out a ton. And you can subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 build guides, guides for how to build characters, tips and tricks and tier lists and so on, and other strategy game content. Cheers, folks. I'll catch you next time.